Welcome to the Old Church of God this morning. We're glad to be back in the house of the Lord. We got some with us today. Uh, we thank you all. I know it's a little different setup for those that's here looking at us, but we try to sing a lot like we've been doing and uh, kind of keep the cameras on me and the preacher. I think some people's camera shy, but uh, you know me. Uh, yeah, all I like is what God thinks about me. I mean, to put it all uh, ugly as whatever you think. That's your opinion, but I think I'm just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but I thank you all for tuning in this morning. If you're out the, the parking lot or if you're uh, at home watching on Facebook or Instagram or the other means that we have, we just want to thank you all. I want to thank those that come out to be with us this morning. Uh, I know it's a little different than what they normally used to with the social distancing and the pew marked off and everything, but hopefully the Lord will continue to move in this and before long, church will be back going. But we just want to thank you all. And, uh, before we get started this morning, let's uh, continue to remember a lot of requests. Uh, we have some uh, families this morning. Let's remember the Bucket family, uh, Sarah Jeff Coat, Charles Powers, uh, Justin and Danny Fox, let's continue to remember them, continue to remember Ann Opal as uh, she's, uh, I know that she's with hospice, has come in, so y'all just really remember her in prayer, that the Lord will touch her, uh, Sister Sue's family, continue to remember them, uh, Miss Bobby, if I'm looking around, I'm trying to read the preacher's hand right, and then, Almost as bad. <laughs> yeah. What I say is about as bad as mine. Uh, but you know, I'm used to reading mine. Uh, so let's, let's re remember him this morning, Donnie Fullman, having knee surgery uh, oh, to continue. It's been, it's, it's been canceled. Yeah, I th kind of thought that was probably going to happen. Uh, there is a counseling, a lot of surgeries now with everything that's going on, but it has been canceled. But y'all still keep it in prayer that God will heal him when you want him out to have it. Uh, Sylvia Lunsford, Mark Morrows, Chase. Yeah, Chase has been battling the infection. He seems to be doing uh, better today, but he had a bad in ear infection most of the week. But we had some antibiotics, stuff, but he is doing, well, he seemed to be doing a lot better yesterday. So y'all just continue to pray for him. Uh, so let's remember all those, and I may have slipped my mind, remember all those that's uh, shut-ins, that can't get out, let's continue to remember those. Yes, uh, Sister Robin's brother Michael, let's remember him in prayer this morning. God knows everything that's going on in each situation, so let's remember all those uh, needs this morning. Uh, continue to remember everything that's going on in the world with this, the, the pandemic, if I'm saying it right, probably not. Pandemic. Yeah, I got a habit of saying panic and I got a stutter in the middle, but pandemic. But I got my correct about today, so I can't just say anything. <laughs> I got total disappointed. I said, this thing will tell you right now whether you love or not being shut up for all this time. <laughs> it'll really, yeah, it really lets you know you and your spouse is in love. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, let's remember all those. I lost loved ones, remember them, continue to lift them up in prayer. Uh, the nation as a whole, like I said, with everything that's going on, continue to remember that God that soon will be opened back up completely as the churches and even as a nation that the Lord will touch and move in a mighty way. Uh, and we're just trusting in Him. And let's continue to remember uh, the soldiers and all those overseas and especially our mothers today. I'd like to wish ever, all the mothers, Godmothers, uh, all of y'all, uh, Happy Mother's Day today. We, we just want to thank y'all all for what y'all done in raising your children and it is just a, a wonderful thing. I'm not a mother, but I am. I'm a father, but it's, you can't take a mother's place. There's nothing you can do to take a mother's place. A mother has a special place in each and every child's heart. You can rest assured about that. They always have godmothers who they just have that, that place 
in, in their hearts. He's the one that's sick child hollers. He don't holler daddy. He hollers mama. When he's afraid, he'll sometimes holler daddy. But usually he hollers mama. He or my hoe, either one. So y'all just, I just want to thank all the mothers and, and ask that God's blessing will be upon y'all this morning as we go before the Lord in prayer. So as we go before the Lord in prayer, if anybody wants to mention a name or anything so we can know. Okay, remember the Simony family, uh, Linda, uh, Linda Sins, ain't, uh, they, as she passed away. So y'all remember that family. Remember Sandra Hall. Yes, and Sandra Hall, let's lift her up in prayer this morning. For no one else, let's all just go before the Lord at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, to lift you up and praise you and honor you. Lord, we just want to give you the glory for the many things that you've done and the times you've touched and ministered and moved in our lives. For the many blessings you give each and every one of us, Lord. We want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for all those that can be out with us this morning, Lord, to, to worship, Lord. We ask that you would touch them and strengthen them, Lord. I ask, Lord, upon these requests, Lord, you've heard the many needs and the names, Lord, and you know each and every need, whether someone's sick in body, Lord, or, or they're going through other difficulties with life, whether it's financial or spiritual, especially in this time, Lord. There are a lot of financial issues going on, Lord, with this pandemic that we're going through, Lord. So we ask that you would just touch and minister to those in need today, Lord. Touch those physically, Lord. Give them that healing touch that only you can give, Lord, as we lift, you, lift them up to you. And I ask, Lord, that you would touch each and every one today, Lord, those that may be fighting a spiritual battle, Lord, the devil may be coming against them, trying to destroy them. I ask that you would move upon them, Lord, and strengthen them, Lord Jesus. Jesus, and give them that measure of faith that they can gain victory this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to touch and move upon our lost loved ones, wherever they may be, that they would accept you. I ask, Lord, that you would touch and move upon our soldiers, Lord, and lift them up and strengthen them, Lord Jesus, as we lift them all up to you, Lord. And I ask, Lord, our leaders, Lord, that you would move upon them, that they can continue to make the right decisions, Lord, leading us in the right way, Lord. But the main thing, Lord, that they would wake up and realize that this country and this nation needs to get back to you, Lord, that that is the true answer to all our problems, Lord, is just to reach out to you, Lord, that you can see us through no matter what we are facing. So I ask, Lord, that you would touch today as we gather here in your house to lift you up in praise and honor you, Lord, to give you glory for the many blessings you've given us, Lord. And I ask, Lord, that your anointing will be upon the songs that sung today, Lord. Your anointing will be upon the Sunday school lesson this morning that can touch hearts and souls, Lord. And well, the lead brings your message this morning, Lord. Let that special anointing be upon him, Lord, that it can go out and reach out for the saving of lost souls, Lord, and the ministering to each and every saint of God. And we'll just give you praise and honor and glory in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask it all. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. As we begin Sunday school this morning, as I said, we're still in Galatians. It's different. I've been looking at the camera, so y'all catch me looking here instead of at y'all. That's what I've been doing for a month and a half now. So i got to get back to it's a new shift for me, too. <laughs> I got a camera and an audience. but uh, So y'all just remember this morning, I'll try to get my attention to everybody if I can. So, you know, I might be dizzy when it's over with. But, but as we've been talking in Galatians, so if y'all been with us on the radio, on Facebook, or, uh, you know, but today we're still in Galatians. We've been moving through there for the last couple of weeks. Uh, after we left Daniel. So now we're in, in Galatians. We're talking about the children of promise. Paul, as I said, as we started the first two lessons, Paul was combating uh, 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 false teachers. You know, as I said last week, if you was listening, false teachers and false religion. You're not going to hardly get, you can recognize a false religion. If you believe in Jesus Christ, a false religion is going to teach you something other than Jesus Christ. Basically, is they're going to have something in any false religion. They, they, they are a lot more easier to recognize than a false teacher. False teachers, what does the Bible say about false teachers? They come in the house. They come in the church. They come in your house, through your TV or whatever. This is where what false teachers come in. They come in saying things like, it is written. They come in, the Bible says they are wolves in sheep's clothing. So they enter into your house as a sheep, speaking nice and charming words to lure you away. 
You know, they'll come in with, like I say, as it is written. I mean, Paul says that. We've all, we all say that. It is written. But they, they'll come in. They, they'll use the same Bible. They'll, they'll quote scriptures right and left. But they'll start adding to or taking away. And God says nobody can add to or take away from the Word of God. Amen. So if they're telling you something other than, than what the Word of God is telling you, or they're trying to single you out, or they're trying to say, I've got a revelation that only God has given me, then that would make God a secret God. And God is not a God of secrets. He's open to all. As I spoke a little bit last week, God confirmed. You remember Paul, even though Paul started teaching and he knew he was teaching right, he knew he was doing this, and he knew he was being led by God, but he still went back to the council at Jerusalem to get approval. Even if they would have told him he was wrong, he would have kept preaching what he was preaching because he knew he was right. So he knew when he went back and they agreed with him, it was just confirmation. So he was getting confirmation for him and also for them. So they was all getting confirmation. And that's the way God works. So if anybody's saying, you know, God just give me a special, if I stand up here and tell y'all God's giving me a special revelation about the word of God, I'm teaching you wrong. I'm standing before you right now and say, hey, it's time to get a hound on me because I've been started teaching y'all something that's not true and not and is not right. That's what we need to remember. Anyone that starts teaching contrary to the word of God. And I'm not talking about uh, your pastor praying and God giving him a vision for the way the church wants to be. But I can speak for Brother Lee myself. They've been many a times he's come up and started telling me something. And I said, you know, brother, I've been thinking the same thing. That's the way God works. Amen. That is exactly the way God works. I said, you know, or something I might say, well, you know, I was just thinking that same thing the other day. There you go. It's just God confirming what he's given him by me. He may have done it to some of y'all. I'm just speaking for myself and what I do. He may have done it through... You know, with him and Brother John, I, I don't know. You know, and it's the same thing. I mean, it, as it works, but God will confirm things for you to, 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 to make sure you're right. God is not a God of secrets. So if, if I tell you I've got just some single revelation, or anybody out there is telling you that, you need to be aware. And this is what Paul was going against in Galatians. He was going against these leaders, these Jewish Judaizers, as they call them, that was coming in. He was going against basically what we call in this day and age is legalism. He was going against those that was coming in saying you had to do something else to be saved. That, that believing in Jesus Christ, they said, yeah, you had to believe in Jesus Christ, but, but see, there's, there's no but in there. You have to believe in Jesus Christ, but you also have to do this and this and this. You don't have to do this and these things to believe in Jesus Christ. We do the things we do because we believe it, because we put on Christ. Yes. And how have we put him on? By faith. By belief, by believing in the sacrifice that he done, by believing everything that we put Christ on in our life, by faith in Jesus Christ, we are saved. That's the only way to salvation. It's not about what I do or anything like that or how good I am. It's about believing with all my heart and soul, believing with a, you know truly that Jesus is the Son of God. And when I believe that, I'm going to put him on. He's going to come and dwell with me. And I'm going to start, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to start doing things. Because why? As I said, maybe the last week or the week before, it's about love. Yeah. It's a change. You don't think about selfish. You're not selfish anymore. You think more about God than about self. It's not about self anymore. You think more. That's why the two greatest commandments is, first and all, you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He's first in your life. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. It's about love. Love for God and love for one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's basically telling you that you should love your neighbor really more than you should love yourself. Because most of us love ourselves. We ain't just going to go out and hit ourselves with a hammer. We don't you know, anything like that. We, we don't strive. Usually when somebody strives to hurt themselves, they, they an underlying issue there. 
whether it's uh, uh, something mentally or something's got off in the, in the body. No, I'm, I'm not here to say that things like that don't happen. But God can heal these things. But still, yeah, people just don't want to go out and hurt themselves. That's not a natural thing. You know, and, and it's the same way. You don't want to hurt. I mean, and it's not even physical hurt. It's, it's mental hurtness, you know, hurting people mentally. You know, the things you say to people can be hurtful. We try to strive not to do that. That's, that's what love is about. Love helps you keep your mouth shut. Amen. Or it should. Love should, have, love should check you anytime before you open your mouth. Before you say something. You should always think. Because a lot of times you can say, say things that can hurt people and not even realize you've done it. And find out a week later that you really hurt somebody. Or you find out four weeks later when they ain't been to church in four weeks, why ain't they been to church? What's going on? And then somehow then all of a sudden you find out it's because what you said. You know. And what do you do? You try to make it right. It ain't well. That was the truth. When that head shake, you know, that attitude, you know. You know, these young folks are well, yeah, that's the truth, you know. They give you that head shake, whatever else. You know, I don't know what it, what it. I reckon it's just an emphasis or something, but it's the same thing. And this is what Paul was 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 combating. He's combating these false teachers, and I want to get, get caught up on that. But this is what he he was going through, and he was giving them illustrations. So this week we're talking about children of promise. We are children of promise. He says, "You are children of promise. We are children of promise." God made a promise to Abraham. That his seed, that his seed would change everything. Not only that, you know, and we always look at it a lot of times as, you know, the Jews as many, yes they are, and he chose Abraham for them to come through in the name. But when you look at it, when he was talking about Abraham's seed changing the world, he was talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the seed of Abraham that changed everything. It changed the law, it changed Everything, And so that's what we, we're looking at this morning. Paul uses some metaphors and stuff. So as we started, kind of where we left off last week with chapter 22, now we start with chapter 23. It says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterward be revealed. So as he says there, let's, let's read up through 25, will it? It says, so wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Then 25 says, but after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So what, what Paul is saying here, so says the law was like a schoolmaster. You got to understand a schoolmaster in that day was usually, a lot of times it was a slave. In Greek and in, in, in Roman culture, that was a slave. It was a trusted slave that they had brought into the family, you know, uh, they, you know, that was in the family, a trusted deal to train that child till he grew up to a certain age to accept the inheritance. Okay? So what, what, what they would do is... They would discipline the child. When I say discipline, I'm not talking about spankings and stuff like that. What I'm talking about is teaching him the disciplines of life. You know, we have disciplines in life. There's certain things in there. Discipline just don't mean spanking or, or punishment all the time. They're just disciplines, you know, if you understand what I'm saying, that, that we have. We, you know, that we should uh, train them up. Uh, you know, if it was a rich family, they was training them up in the... The, what he needed to live by, you know, just like disciplines. We need to, we need a discipline that we can give our children. Is you need to say grace before you eat. Amen. That is a discipline. Amen. That is a discipline. Just think about it that way. Saying grace before you eat. That is something that you have to, you have to train them to do. If you don't train them when they're little to do it, you know, you start training them when they're little to do it. They'll call you on it sometimes. And you said, <laughs> so I reckon I ain't been the only one got caught. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, when you start giving them kids them disciplines, and that discipline starts setting in, you know, you just say, hey, you know, you say grace. You know, if I see one of them eating, I said, anybody say the blessing? Yeah, I said, you know, 
But if they happen, then, then you know, a lot of times we'll raise a finger like someone with a finger up has to say grace. But and I told the story now, so we can't get nobody out there to go out and eat with us or anything. So they know if they see somebody stick up the finger, they finger. But all I'm saying is, it's, it is a discipline. And, and there are other disciplines in life. I mean, these are disciplines, good things that we teach our children. children to, and we raise them up to life. And this is what a schoolmaster, this is what Paul said. This is what the law was. The law was like the schoolmaster that showed you the way, showed you how to discipline. You know, and a lot of things what we got to understand here, when we talk about the law, we got the Ten Commandments, and then we got the, the ceremonial laws. Don't get me wrong, the Ten Commandments is in effect, but they don't save us. We not saved because we not do we saved by this, and we don't do these things because we are saved. But when Paul's talking, what they was telling him, they had to 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 align up to the festival. To the festival days or the laws, the ceremonial laws, like the festivals that they had, the uh, uh, circumcision, the, the, the all, all the other acts, you know, that they was doing. And this is what the Judaizers was telling them: Oh, if you want to be saved, you got to accept Jesus Christ and do this and this, which is Paul's combating. Paul says, "Okay, no, the law was like that schoolmaster that raises that child up to they about 14, 16 years of age or whatever, till they can become an adult. And when they become at that age, they was taught at that age they could receive the inheritance. The inheritance came from the father." So they could receive the inheritance. So this is what Paul said. So when when we was lost and we was living out in the world, we was under, you know, uh, in, in other words, when we was lost and out under the law, he said, when y'all was under the law, before Jesus Christ came, y'all was under the law, y'all was under like this taskmaster training y'all. But now Jesus Christ has come, so you are no longer under this taskmaster. Now you are able to receive the inheritance. You are that age that you receive your inheritance now from the Father. I mean, that's, that's what he's, Paul's going through. He says, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. That's what he's saying there. After faith has come, we don't have to, we're not under the law anymore. We're not under the schoolmaster anymore. We're not under the teacher. The law was to teach us. It was to teach us uh, right from, well, basically what, he's, what Paul's mainly talking about here is the law was teaching you the way to Jesus Christ. That's why if you do a study on the ceremonial laws, they represent everything about different things about Christ, the sacrifices and everything that had to be made in these ceremonial laws. They led you to show you, they taught you to, the, to take you to the place of faith where you could receive the inheritance that was there to begin with from Abraham, as we talked about the other week. It's always been about faith, even before the law. Because Abraham received it on faith before the law. So that's what he's saying. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So we don't have to abide by these ceremonial things that they got there. Now, since faith has come, we do the things we do because of that faith and because of Jesus Christ. We put on Christ. Amen. So we want to be like Christ. So that's why we do what we do. Not to be saved. You can do these things all day. You know, what did he tell the church in, in Ephesus? He says, you've lost your first love. You're doing this, and you're doing this, and you're doing this, but, but what? You've lost your first love. So what is he saying? He's saying you're in a backslidden state. You've, you've fell back because you're still going through all these things, and we can do it this day and age, keep going through all these things, and lose our love for Christ, and be lost our faith for Christ, <laughs> Because all of a sudden we went from having faith and believing in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord to trying to work our way into heaven by doing this, 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 and this. And we can't do that. It doesn't work that way. We do this because of that faith. That faith is what starts wavering in our lives. If you lose out on Christ, it's not because you quit doing good. It's because you've lost your faith. Amen. Nobody backslides by not doing good, but but it's going to work the same way. When you start losing your faith, you're going to quit doing good. Amen. You know, because it, it all revolves around faith in 
Christ. And then as we're going to 46, it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So he says, but all of you, so he's telling you, all of you are children of God by faith in Christ. You know, the word children here in the Greek text literally means sons. So you are all sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We have been adopted. We are sons and daughters in Jesus Christ because we've been adopted into it. So that's what basically children mean here. It means sons. And it emphasizes, as I was saying, it emphasizes the maturity. They, after the schoolmaster, you become mature so you can go ahead and you can uh, receive the inheritance because you are a mature child. So this is it's what it is. I mean, it's not the actual Greek word for children. I mean, for, for, for children, is not being used here because that means endearment or tenderness. But the word that's used in here basically means, as I said, it, it, it means you are, you are full, you are mature, you, you are able to receive the possessions. How? By faith, as it said, by faith in Jesus Christ. For you are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, and then as we're going on, uh, 27 says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So Paul's not saying that you have to be baptized, you know, to, to be saved. No, you don't. You know, you don't. Nothing. We go back to the same thing. Baptism don't save you. You can take the Lord's Supper all day long. It's not going to save you. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you should be baptized. We should participate in the Lord's Supper. These are sacraments. But, so, but, but you can't just do them as rituals. We don't, we don't, I mean, it's, it's not a ritual. I mean, it's a, it's a it's sacrament. It's sacred. When you participate in the Lord's Supper, it should be sacred to you. In other words, if you, you can do it, I believe you can do it too often. That's just my opinion. Because when you, sometimes when you start doing something too often, I know the Lord says, do this and remember of me. Yes, we should do it. But we should do it at the right time. And when you go to do it, you should do it with a pure heart. You should seek out God. You could seek out for what he, you know, to make sure nothing's wrong in your life before you participate in this. Because it is sacred. It's a sacred event. That's what I got. It is sacred. Baptism is sacred. That's what I mean. You shouldn't go get baptized unless you are forgiven, unless you accept Jesus Christ. So he's not saying you have to be baptized. He's saying through your faith, you was baptized, which probably all of us have been. Through our faith, we accepted Jesus Christ, and we wanted to be baptized. Because we wanted to make that confirmation that we had accepted it. It's a confirmation. The Lord's Supper is something we do in remembrance of Him. So we won't forget it. But you, you know how easy it is if you start doing something over and over and over and over and over. You can get complacent with it. Amen. There's nothing wrong with doing it as, as many times as you want. But what you've got to be wary of is do not let it be complacent. I go back to the church in Ephesus. What did he say? You've lost your foot. They had probably started doing all this good, and next thing they know, they've caught themselves up, and they, they've become complacent. Okay, we just do this, and they forgot what everything's all about, that it's about Jesus Christ and faith in him. It says, for as many as you have been baptized into Christ. I mean, we are running up behind, way behind. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond or free, there is neither male or female, for ye are all one in Christ. What is he saying here? He's just knocking this partiality thing out of head. God is not a partial God. This is what he's saying here. In God's sight, you ain't Greek, you ain't, you ain't this, you ain't that. you just one of his children. Just think about you, if you have a, you and your children, the other ones you love at this point. You know, you may treat them different because they have different needs, they have different ways you treat them, but you know, you love them the same. You love each and every one of your child the same. Some of them it may be a little more needier than others. Some of them, you know, they all got, because they've got different attitudes. One of them may not need what the other one needs, you know, and, and things like that. It, it, it's what I'm saying, you know, if you if you got more than one child, you know that they, they got different they got different attitudes. 
or different things. And, you know, I can tell you with my grandkids, you know, I got one, you know, you, you say anything to her, she gonna cry. You know, I got one that when she cries, you, she, you don't hurt her feelings. You can rest assured of that. Then I got another one, he's, I don't know, I can't explain that one. It's just, <laughs> I'll just take this gene to the <laughs> He's just stubborn. That's all I can tell you. He's a stubborn child. And then I got another one that is he's just calm and quiet. And, you know, but he cares. You can tell he cares. Because if I'm saying something to one of the other ones, he'll come, what, what, what are you saying, Pop? Why? Why is he doing it? Because he cares. Does he run around and hug him with all this? No, you don't see that. But you can tell by their actions that he cares. You know, and that's, that's all I'm saying. I can, I can see the differences in them, and probably all y'all can see the differences in your children. And you have to treat them in different ways, you know. Some of them you can pick at, some of them you can't. You know, and don't be like me. Pick at the ones you shouldn't. Not <laughs> but they know I'll pick it up. But, uh, all I'm saying is, is that we love them all the same. And that's what Christ is saying now. He's saying, you know, no matter whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're a Jew or a Greek, no matter what nationality you are, it's in the same way today. doesn't matter what skin color you are or nothing. God loves us all the same. And he's provided Christ the same sacrifice for all of us. So it doesn't matter whether you're male or female or, or uh, you know, or Jew or Greek or, or nationality. It doesn't matter. All of us have to come to Jesus Christ the same way, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So he says, so if you be in Christ, which was the promised seed of Abraham, and if you be in him, are you not? So he's going back to something that they knew, truly understood, Abraham's seed, and heirs to the promise that God made him. So this is the promise that God made him. The promise God, the main promise God made to Abraham was the seed of Jesus Christ was coming from your lineage. Because of what? His faith. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be the Lord of all. So what is he saying is, when I go back to what I was talking about, now child here is in the Greek is used in a different way. It means like an infant. So in other words, what he's saying is, when you was a child, when you was an infant, when you was under the law, let me just say it to you this way, because this is what he's meaning, as long as you was under the law, differeth nothing from a servant. You was the same as, as the servant, the servant, the schoolmaster, the teacher that was teaching you, you was the same. Though he was, though you was the heir to all of it. You know, the schoolmaster, look at the schoolmaster, or the test, that's the law. He says, as long as you was under the law, you was no different. You was the same. But you were still the heir because you had the opportunity to grow through, though he was the Lord of all. But is under tutor and governors until the time appointed of the Father. <coughs> but is under, so what he's saying is like I was just talking earlier. He's under that. You under the law until this time come. What was the time is he talking about? Jesus Christ. This is what he's talking about. When you, you left this child, he's just referring back to, to, to the culture of that day, what was going on. And so when they became heir, basically we became heirs with Jesus Christ, through Christ. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So when we was under the law, we was just like everybody else. We was in bondage. We was in bondage under the law. That's what the law put us in bondage. We was under bondage. But when the fullness of time was come, it says, but when the fullness of time was come, it's basically saying, when God saw fit, if you want to just put it that way, when God said, this is when it's going to happen, the law's going to lead you to this point, to the fullness of time, which the Bible tells us, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, the fullness of time was when Jesus came. God sent forth his son, made a woman, made under the law. So he said, Jesus came to redeem us. He came to bring us back. 
to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. So he's, he's come, Jesus comes, so we was under the law, y'all was under the law. Remember I said the other week, the law could not save you. I mean, it could, it could save you in a sense, but the law could not forgive your sins. All it done was covered them up to where you had a, a relationship to, in a sense, to God, well, you know, that's all the sacrifice. That's why they had to keep doing them over and over and over. But Christ came, and through faith, our sins can be forgiven, never more to be remembered. Christ forgives sins. He don't cover them up. He don't hide them. He don't do this. He says, I will put them away. When you accept him through faith, he puts the sins away, never more to be remembered. That's what we need to remember. He puts the sins away. And this is what he said, to redeem us. He came to redeem them that were under the law. So Christ came to redeem y'all. You remember, Paul's talking to the Galatians, but he's talking to us also. He came to redeem y'all from the law. He came to set you free from that tutor. But now, since Christ has come, you have become full-fledged. You are now the heir. It says, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So now since God has sent forth his son and he's changed and you have become heir, he sent you his spirit that you can call out to him, Abba, Father. That's a, that's a, a sign of, of love and compassion is what it is. You call it out to God. And Abba, uh, you know, Abba, Father. You know, as singing praises unto God. You're thanking God and you're giving praise for what God has done. You know, because he set us free from bondage. <clears throat> That's what we need to remember. We've been set free. For, wherefore thou art no more as servants, but as a son. So we're not servants under the law anymore. Now we become sons. If you accept that Jesus Christ, you know, by faith, Faith and faith alone. You have become an heir. You have become the son of God or the daughter of God. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, Lord, you have become a child of God. Amen. It's the same way with adoption. When you adopt a child, that child becomes your heir. You treat him and love him just like a parent would love the 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 full blood child or whatever you want to say. I mean, but you adopt him and that's what God, he's adopted us in and God loves us just as much as he loved Jesus Christ. That's what we need to remember because he sent his son. God, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. He sent Jesus Christ to die for us that we could be reconciled to him, that we could be redeemed. We are redeemed. That means we've been bought back. We've been bought back. We was under we was under the law. We was under the penalty. We was under the schoolmaster, if you want to say as Paul's saying here. We was under these things that we couldn't get out of. We had to, and the only way we could get out of is God had to send forth his son, and he did. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ Jesus. So now we are an heir of God through Christ Jesus, as I was just saying. So now we've come. It says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto, unto them which by nature are no gods. So what is he saying? So how by it then when ye knew not when, in other words, when you did not when you didn't know God, you did service unto them by nature that are not God. So what he's saying is, we as humans was created by God and we're going to worship something. It's in our nature. Amen. Our nature. Worship is in our nature. So basically what he was saying to them, while you were still under law and sin, you was out worshiping these other gods. You know, we know, we read the Old Testament, we know a lot of things that the Jews done. They worship false gods. The Bible, the Greeks worship false gods. You got Zeus and, and, and all the gods that they had that they worship. And that's what he's saying. By nature, by that very nature that's in us, we needed something to worship. So they were reaching out for anything. It's the same way in this day and age. What takes place in your heart is what you're going to worship. What are you worshiping today? What takes place? What is number one in your heart? That's a question for all of us today. What is number one in your heart? 
Is it your bank account? Is it your children? Ooh, you're getting down to the nitty gritty here now. Brother Tim, what is it? What is number one in your heart? Amen. You know, it's not taking the love you have for your, your children away or your spouse or anything else, but what is number one in your heart? That is what you worship. That is what you're going to be in tune to. You know, it don't mean you don't love your children. It don't mean you won't die for your children and all. But what's going to make you do that is that love for God. Remember, love for God is going to make you love a stranger. Love for God is going to make you love your enemies. Yeah. That's, that's what he's about. That's what he's saying. That, that, that's the love that we have. So what are we putting in place? He says, so all of a sudden now, y'all, y'all was doing all this. And then you came to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through faith. So why do you want to go back to this? You know. Why would you want to go back to something after you've tasted something good? It's kind of like you go to two restaurants and you buy about steak at both of them. One of them is bad, one of them is good. You done tasted this one good, so why do you really want to go back over there? You even try, somebody comes up, let's go here and eat. You kind of, well, I'll go if you want to go. But you try to steer them away from it. Why? Because the other place is better. So that's what he said. You found something a whole lot better. So why do you want to go back and, and, and get a hold of something that ain't, ain't doing you no good? Uh, you know, it, it ain't good. But now that after you have known God, or rather, or known of God, how turn you, what I was saying, I think I'm getting ahead of my scriptures, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements. How, in other words, how if you've tasted of God, how can you turn back to the weak things? Like, if you went and ate that good old delicious steak, the best you've ever eaten, how can you go back to, to this place where you ain't never got a good one? But this is what he's saying. This is basically what you're doing. You're going back to something that's not as good. Why would you do that? You observe days and months and times and years. So that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the, the ceremonial laws where they had to do the feast and, and, and all the other things that there was. I'm afraid of you, least I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul says, I'm afraid for you. That's basically what he's saying. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. You know, when it says, I am afraid of you, basically he's saying, I'm afraid for you. In other words, it's in his heart, he's afraid. It scares him that because you've tasted of Jesus Christ. You know what the Bible says? To him who putteth his hand upon the plow and looketh back is not fit for the kingdom of God. This is basically kind of what Paul's saying here. I'm afraid that you're going to lose out because you're going back to what? The old elements of the world. You're going back into the world. You're going back under the law. You're going back under the law. I'm afraid of you, least I bestow. Said, brethren, I, I beseech you as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not inquired me at all. Says that you ain't asked me nothing or inquired of me anything, but I beseech you to ask me. Let's go ahead, brother. Says, ye know how thoroughly. How through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. It says, where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear ye record that if it had been I, possibly, you would have plucked out my own eyes and have given them to me. So Paul's going through that. He, he, first, he says, when I come to you, I was in infirmities. He, I was in a bad condition. You remember the temptation that Paul says, you know, he kept praying for God about. He says, I wasn't coming to you, probably. I wasn't coming to you looking good. I wasn't coming to you in any other shape or form. As a, you know, he got to been looking like a beggar. He says, I was coming to you in infirmities when I preached this, but you accepted it. You accepted me. He says, you accepted me to the point that you would 
you know, you'd pluck out your own eyes for me because you believed that solid about what I was teaching you. Even though I wasn't for say up here in a great spent great suit and my hair hair all in place. What little I do have anyway. All my hair is in place and pretty much stays in place anymore. But he said, but what he's saying is you weren't looking on my appearance or anything like that. You heard the word that I was preaching, you accepted the word that I was preaching. That's what he's saying. He says, Where is then that the blessing that you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes. That's what he's saying. He would have plucked them out. He says, And I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. He says, Am I your enemy now because I'm telling you the truth? I'm telling you the truth the right way. You know, that's what he's saying. I'm telling you the truth. So am I your enemy now? Because I'm going back and telling you the truth. I'm telling you what is truth. He says, They zealous affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. That's why your brother doesn't read on through this. He says, But it is good to be zealous, affected always, and it's a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. So you need to do this not only when I'm here, but when I'm not. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. He says, so I'm, I'm doing my best to get you back on the right track. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. He says, I'm worried. Basically, I'm not in doubt of you. I'm worried about where you're headed. I wish, wish I could be there with you right now to, to, to manifest this. I'm writing you this letter, but I wish I could be there with you. It's, it's, it's what he's saying now. Tell me, ye that desire to be under. So he's going, he's going back to the false teachers. To everybody. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? So he's saying, okay, if you want to be under the law, don't you hear the law? For it is written. He says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondsmaid and the other after a free woman. So he says, Abraham had two sons. He had, he had one of the flesh, which was a representation or, or allegory, as they call it, the law. So basically he's saying, Abraham didn't trust in God right then. They tried through the flesh to make God's promise. You can't do that. You can't make God's promises yourself or through the flesh. And that's what he's saying. Abraham tried to do that. He says, which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which uh, generated to bondage, which is Agar. So Agar was a slave woman. So he's comparing Agar. He says, okay, Agar is like the, the law that was given on Mount Sinai. Let's go ahead, brother. It says, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So now Agar was a slave. She was in bondage. So he tried to, to, to feel God's promise through the flesh. And it doesn't work that way. That's what we need to remember. It doesn't work that way. It's not through the flesh. You can't fulfill. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So basically what he's saying is Agar represented the law. Abraham's first life. Because she was born in slavery. We were all born in slavery. We were born under the law. That's what Agar was, a slave. She was not of promise. Her son was not of promise. You know, Ishmael and Isaac, her son was Ishmael. He was not a promised son. He did receive an inheritance. God gave him an inheritance because he was Abraham's son. But he was not the promised child that the seed was going to come through. So Ishmael, when you start looking at that, he was a, <clears throat> a son born of the flesh, not the promise of God. But then when you go to Isaac, Isaac was a promise son. Isaac said, Sarah, the free woman, was going to have a child that would be your heir, that would be heir to the seed. Remember, I keep saying seed, not seeds, but seed. Because that's what Abraham led us to. The seed, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. 
He is the seed. Abraham has many seeds. He is a great nation. I'm like a great nation. All that's true. But when he says, you look at it, when the Bible saying seeds and seed, when it's saying seed, it's talking about Jesus Christ. When it's talking to Abraham, your son. And, and remember, Sarah was free. God promised him a son through Sarah. That would set us all free through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. How was Abraham set free? Through faith. Before the seed, before the law, before it all, Abraham was set free by his faith. So it has nothing had nothing to do with the law. It wasn't given. And then he said, just as he's using this as an example, Ishmael and, and, and Isaac. Isaac was a promised son that the seed would come from. Ishmael was like the wood. It was a law. It was a law. It was born of the flesh. He was born of the flesh. He had an inheritance. The wood has an inheritance. You know, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you got an inheritance. You got the whole world out here. I'm here standing right now. If you don't accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you got the whole world you can choose. That's your choice. You either choose Jesus Christ, which was a promise, or you got the whole world out here you can choose and everything of it. See, we make a choice. And that's what he's saying. And he, he also said that what, what happened? What's the world going to do to you if you said Jesus Christ? The same thing Ishmael done to Isaac. He tormented him when he was a child. Read, I mean, go back and read in Genesis, you'll see. You know, and what he done to him. How he persecuted him. How God sent him out. God sent him out. Why? To make the new way. So that's what we need to remember. For it is written, Rejoice thou there, that dearest not break forth and cry, thou that travailest, not for the desolate hath many more children than are which hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So we are Abraham's children. We're the children of promise. Let's go ahead and finish it up. But as, that, but as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so... It is now. So even so, he's telling us all right then, we will be persecuted as Christians and not going to accept us. Why? Because we're not going to be part of the world. We live in the world, but we're not part of it. Amen. We're not going to do the things in the world. Why? To be saved? No. We don't do the things and participate in things that's, that's not good for us and, 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 and things like this, you know, and participate in sins. Why? Because we have faith in Jesus Christ and we have been set free. We are not bound by nothing. We don't have to be bound. And that's what he's saying to them. You don't have to be bound under the law. We are not bound. The law bound them. The law made them bond slaves. It was a slave master that held you under. You had to do this and this and this and this. But Jesus Christ came that all we have to do for salvation is to say, Jesus, forgive me. And mean it. But it's still not a license to go and do everything you want. Anything you want to do. Because when you do that in Christ, what did he say? Christ, the Spirit comes and dwells with you. And when he does, what happens? We change. We change. So as I conclude this morning, I'm about to, yeah, I went over talking anyway, not normal. But as I conclude this morning, that's the main thing we need to understand. We are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Nothing else. That's the only way. There's no other way that man can be saved. No other way anybody can be saved except through faith in Jesus Christ. And that faith in Jesus Christ is what makes us love one another. It's what makes us not want to hurt one another. It makes us to obey obedient to his word. You know, if I've done you a spectacular favor, I guarantee you're going to be wanting to do me one back. Amen. Just think of that yourself. If somebody done something great, you was in a mess and somebody done something great for you, wouldn't you like to repay them in some way? Well, we can't repay God for what he done. There's no way we can pay him. But we will live our life like we're trying to. Amen. That's what you need to remember. You will live your life like you've tried to. Not that he asked you to, but he's commanded in his word you need to do. If everybody would have 
you know what? If everybody probably would, would, would have been following the woods since the very beginning, we wouldn't have to be worrying about no diseases or anything else. I mean, there ain't no commandment that God's given to any of us that's bad for us. Brother Johnny said that many a times, and it's true, 100%. God has given us no command for us that's bad. Amen. So y'all just remember that. And I thank y'all this morning. So Amen. we'll probably take just five minutes and since we got the air time. Thank y'all.